Now, I'm sure most of you have seen this data before, but I do want to highlight the relevant pieces here. Uh, approximately 4 million people live in Maricopa County, and uh, more, that represents more than half of the state's population. Most interestingly is about two-thirds, or 62% of that population, is of working age. So uh, doing something like this is a really important way to reach folks at the population level. In addition, uh, from a demographic point of view, you mostly have a, a Caucasian population, 85% and 15% uh, people of color, although 30% uh, define themselves as having um, Hispanic heritage, and 16% are foreign born. So these are important uh, facts to keep in mind. What we wanted to do now is to basically give you a sense of the physical and economic burden of chronic diseases in Maricopa County. And this comes from the Maricopa County Health Status Report. Um, and the reason why this is important is it really shows the business case for Maricopa County. And we focus on chronic diseases because uh, for, for two main reasons. One is 75% of our healthcare, country, nation's healthcare costs really come from chronic diseases. But more importantly, from a public health perspective, uh, most of them are preventable. And so uh, given that there are interventions that we can do to improve these outcomes, this is really an important thing for us to be working on. What I'd like to do is call your attention to this chart where uh, we look at the four most um, prevalent premature uh, deaths that come from uh, the, the major chronic diseases, which include cardiovascular, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases, which are emphysema and asthma primarily, and diabetes. And let you know that in just one year, for instance, with CBD, you've almost had 7,000 cases that landed in the hospital at almost $3.4 billion. Cancer of over 5,500 cases, and by the way, they're mostly lung cancer, at $850 million. We have chronic respiratory conditions, 1,460 cases, $260 million. And, and these are, by the way, just hospital costs. We are not even looking at urgent care visits and other settings, medication costs and the like. And then diabetes, we had 700 cases that landed in the hospital, but look at how expensive they are. They're half the number of the cases, but they cost almost as much as chronic uh, respiratory diseases. There's one other thing that I'd like to bring your attention to. As we're talking about demographics, uh, it's always important to look at health disparities. And Maricopa County has health disparities just as we find anywhere else in the nation. But in particular, related to these chronic diseases, African Americans and American Indian populations have much higher rates of these diseases. And in particular, cancers and cardiovascular diseases, um, African Americans have much higher, higher um, age-adjusted death rates. Uh, and in asthma, we have two times higher rates in black population and eight times higher in the American Indian population. In diabetes, we see three times higher in the African American and seven times higher in uh, the American Indian uh, population. So as you're thinking about uh, targeting resources and where uh, you know, the high-risk cases are and the costly cases, it would behoove you to target your um, services uh, in addition to these vulnerable populations. Now, I'm also, uh, it's important to understand, as I mentioned, that really there are modifiable behaviors associated with these chronic diseases uh, that are really important to pay attention to so that you can target them in the workplace. And what's really important here is if you look at the five national leading causes of death, the four top ones are chronic diseases. The fifth one is unintentional injuries. And that's definitely related to the workplace because uh, injuries in the workplace as a result of the workplace as well as uh, illnesses are important to uh, pay attention to. But what is most interesting is, is that there are a few issues that if you um, address will influence multiple chronic diseases at once. So tobacco, for instance, as we know, affects cancers, and, and lung uh, cancers were the most prevalent hospitalizations. 
that we just saw, as well as chronic, uh, I mean, coronary heart disease and stroke, as well as respiratory diseases. Overweight and obesity related to nutritional and physical activity um, uh, behaviors influence cancer rates, CVD, uh, and even obesity is, is uh, correlated with asthma. And we also know that um, alcohol is, uh, is correlated to cancer rates and certainly to unintentional injury rates. I do also want to just raise um, your awareness that, you know, toxins and pollutants are not only associated with asthma, but with cancer and cardiovascular as well. And that mental health issues such as depression and anxiety are one of the number one costs that employers incur. And we really have to look at that as well. And look at these statistics on the bottom. 58% of Arizona adults have one or more uh, diagnosis of chronic diseases. And they're, mo they're adults. So again, the workplace is an important target. So what we did was we met with um, many of you who are listening to this webinar in Arizona to do a little bit of a planning process and to really focus in on which policy targets made the most sense to address uh, in your work. And the five that came up to the top were obesity prevention, that is healthy eating and active living, tobacco prevention and control, chronic disease prevention and self-management, preventive screening and immunizations, and then we added occupational and health and safety, specifically muscular skeletal, skeletal diseases such as carpal tunnel and um, uh, muscular skeletal pain such as headaches and back injuries are really important uh, to address. I'd like to also just call your attention to the business sector itself because I think that again as you're targeting your work, this is important information to consider. So of the 4 million residents, about half of them are eligible to work in the um, workforce. Now, you have a range of employers and based on the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics from 2010, you have five leading in, um, industries, and most of those industries are in the service sector. Uh, and they are professional and business services, educational and government services, production and transport, health and sciences, and leisure and hospitality. Also, your workforce is unusually highly trained and educated and tend to be on the youthful side. Now, only a small percentage are unionized, but we wanted to point that out because uh, many of the successful work, uh, healthy worksite initiatives are labor management programs, and this is something to keep in mind. And finally, uh, if you look at the pie chart on the right, uh, this is something that's very important, that over 90% of the firms in Maricopa are considered small to medium. And in fact, over 50%, 54% have five or less employees. So the sweet spot, well, and also those with the 250 or more tend to already have uh, worksite wellness programs. So your sweet spot, in our opinion, is really the mid-size uh, to smaller employers of between 20 or 15 to, to 100 employees. They're the ones that don't tend to have the, the programs, but um, could really make it uh, economically viable. So why are work sites a key place for public health? I think the most important reason is, is that you've got a captive audience. Just as we reach out to education uh, schools as a way to capture children because they're in schools most of the day, adults spend most of their waking hours in work sites. Um, and so employers really have uh, the opportunity to influence the health of um, their workers. And in addition, there's really a growing evidence base um, that shows that these programs work and they're cost effective. For instance, the American Cancer uh, uh, Association, the American Heart Association, Healthy People 2020, the CDC, NIOSH, Trust for America's Health, all say that there is enough of an evidence base that we really need to focus in these areas. And yet, as proven as they are, only about 7% of employers have comprehensive health, healthy worksite programs. 
businesses have an economic rationale for wanting to be in this uh, game as well. First of all, um, it's a way for them to lower their claims for medical care, and really because of our uh, skyrocketing health care claims, it really has put employers at a disadvantage competitively, not only uh, within the nation, but internationally as well. So given that we saw that over 50% of adults have one or more chronic diseases, you can only imagine that that affects productivity and competitiveness by, um, uh, by increasing absenteeism and presenteeism. For those of you who aren't familiar with the concept of presenteeism, that's when workers come to work, but they're still not working optimally because they themselves are sick. Um, or because they have family members who are sick. And actually, that's more costly to employers than even absenteeism. Um, but by putting these programs in place, we have the chance of increasing productivity, lowering health care expenditures, increasing employee morale and loyalty, loyalty, I'm sorry, as well as um, there is a, a, a real research base now on the positive return on investment. In fact, the U.S. Task Force of Community Preventive Services showed that for every dollar an uh, um, employer invests in healthy worksite programs, they stand to save $3.20. And there's a whole lot more information that we provided in that first report that not only looks at the overall savings, but specific savings with specific interventions. So what can employers do? And if there's one major uh, sort of snapshot of what they can do, we would say it would be to create a culture of health with, uh, for their employees by focusing on policies and strategies that and make adopting healthy behaviors the easier choice. Another important concept we learned was about the importance of integrating not only personal wellness, but occupational health and safety. There's nothing that irks employees more than having employers saying, oh, you should be eating right, but then they don't provide the opportunities to do that, or their work sites are really dangerous places to work. So we have to work on a comprehensive in intervention in order to really have meaning. And also, we want to target um, the biggest impact and cost saving issues, but at the same time pay attention to those issues that the employees themselves want to focus on. Because if they're not behind this, it's not going to work. Now why are we focusing on policies and environmental strategies? This is called the health impact pyramid that we've shared with you in um, our planning sessions. It was developed by Dr. Tom Frieden, who's the head of the CDC. And this uh, pyramid shows at the top of the pyramid those interventions that public health tends to take that have the smallest impacts in changing long-lasting behaviors. So one-on-one -on -one education and counseling sessions just don't seem to reach broad populations and have lasting interventions. Whereas the larger impact ones are those that really focus on the long-lasting preventive inter interventions such as screenings and immunizations and those that change the context in which people live and work. And these are the areas that we really want to focus Maricopa County on because we believe that they will have the best impact. So just to give you some examples of the kinds of policies and environmental strategies we're talking about, for healthy eating, we're talking about perhaps uh, looking at vending machines and cafeteria offerings, for, uh, promoting active living, really uh, making stairwell improvements that will make using stairs uh, um, a place that people want to use as opposed to using the elevators, or offering gym discounts and making compute community partnerships with the local Y, for instance. Um, chronic disease prevention, such as online, CDSM programs can be very promising and they're growing in popularity, as well as insurance coverage, which promotes um, low-cost uh, prevention. We want to look at screenings and immunizations, such as flu clinics. Uh, you can offer directly or blood pressure and lipid screenings, or you can, again, bring partners into the workforce to, to do this kind of work. And it's really important that we not neglect stress management, because that's really important for employees. So flex time for parents or activity breaks so people can actually get up from their desks and get outside or 
use some exercise equipment are really important. And I don't want people to forget that communicable diseases are really important as I'm like, as you probably can hear, I'm a little nasal. I've come in with my cold today, but I definitely wanted to do this webinar. Um, hand washing stations and re important reminders and having policies about people being sick are really important. <clears throat> So I'm going to wrap up now and basically just say what the literature says in terms of best practices for local health departments in doing this work. And here are the eight categories essentially that health departments really have opportunities to become engaged in. Building awareness, supporting collaborations with businesses by really building the local business case, convening um, businesses together so that they can learn together, um, maybe uh, uh, arranging peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, bringing the larger firms together with the local, uh, the smaller firms to learn about what they're doing, perhaps um, arranging small business purchasing collaboratives so that the smaller businesses who can't afford to do this on their own can work with other businesses in their area to purchase um, programs together and make it cheaper for them and more affordable. In addition, doing health assessments. We can provide them, or you can provide them, with um, check sheets on how to do, how um, they can, employees can do their own health risk assessments. Or there are organizational uh, risk assessments that really help them look at their, whether they're offering a culture of health. There are planning opportunities that um, can help them think about doing a health improvement plan within their work site. There's training in TA that you can provide to help build capacity and skills to have successful outcomes. You can help them build infrastructure by maybe um, uh, figuring out ways to bring, have management and employee involvement in this work, setting up um, workplace wellness councils or com uh, committees within the workplace environment, identifying champions or bringing evaluation resources to the employers. Certainly policy development, we've heard a lot that employers want this to be easy, so providing them the best practices that we've shared with you so that they can pick and choose which ones work for their environment could be really helpful. Program implementation, like the chronic disease self-management programs, um, tobacco cessation, asthma education, and flu clinics are all things that you can provide directly as long as they have policies that will allow employees to participate. And also health communications and social marketing that will help to reinforce the goals can be very powerful. So these are the kinds of things that we've um, uh, shown in detail. And now what we'd like to do is turn this over to Tony Weintraub, who is a special project manager here at HRIA, who spoke with uh, model state and local health departments across the country about actually how they do their work, as well as the trends, successes, and challenges she's seen. Now, some of this will overlap with the literature findings that I've just spoken about, but there are nuances to the personal interviews that she's going to share that can be helpful in moving the Maricopa efforts forward. So, Tony. Hi everyone, Tony Weintraub, and I just wanted to start by saying for this qualitative research piece of work that we've done for Maricopa County, we conducted a total of 49 key informant interviews, and of these, 24 focused on the role of local health departments in healthy worksite initiatives. Uh, of, of the 24, five uh, people that we spoke to were national healthy worksite leaders, six were state health departments, 11 of them were local county health departments, and two represented vendors or benefits brokers. Okay, so the first thing we asked them about was uh, to identify trends that they're seeing in healthy worksite initiatives. Uh, they described a shifting perspective of employers. Uh, that employers are now beginning to view healthcare as an investment rather than an expense. And they are starting to understand that in de further investment in the treatment model is not going to impact rising healthcare costs. Therefore, efforts are being redirected towards health promotion and integrated health management approaches. Employers are starting to move from focusing on individual strategies to addressing the influence of the physical environment on health of the general employee population, uh, similar to the movement that Lori was talking about in the health impact pyramid towards higher impact 
approaches and trying to change, make changes to the physical environment to make the healthy choice the easy choice. <clears throat> so these policy and environmental strategies will reach all employees rather than focusing solely on the high-risk individuals. And this trend is grounded by research on the continuum of health risks that has illuminated the natural migration from low-risk, low-cost populations to higher-risk, higher-cost populations, um, as described by one of our healthy worksite experts. Risk is not static. Employers should not ignore their low-risk individuals because eventually these people will start to develop diseases and become higher-risk individuals. Um, and another trend they're seeing is that many employers are starting to offer incentives for healthy behavior changes. Um, these include such things as financial awards, additional vacation days, uh, various prizes uh, for such activities as completing the health risk assessment, losing weight, quitting smoking, um, and they've also done some company-wide challenges that have been a fun way to get many employees involved, such as Lose to Win program and Walking program. Okay. Um, engaging the community um, has also um, been an area of increased emphasis for employers, uh, bring, sort of dating back to the model where communities depended on one main employer that was involved in all aspects of the community. And this has advantages for the employer as well. They're starting to see the benefit of improving the health of the community in which they're located, um, as this is a source of their future employee stock. And um, some, some particularly innovative employers are beginning to demonstrate wellness as a core organizational value by such things as aligning wellness objectives with business objectives, and some even go as far as putting wellness measures into performance reviews. One area that is just still remains a challenge is evaluation of impact. Um, it's a challenge as well as an opportunity. There are no widely recognized standards in this area yet, um, but the ROIs that have been demonstrated are promising, and the changes that we're starting to see in social norms around health are also beginning to um, d define and dictate best practices. <clears throat> so we asked them to identify uh, employee, uh, pot potential employ opportunities for local health departments. And some of the ones they highlighted are listed here. Um, the local health departments are seen in general as a neutral party and are a welcome partner uh, to employers in the business industry. Um, and one, one successful approach has been to co-facilitate these efforts with cha local chambers of commerce um, as well as local business groups. It tends to both add credibility as well as increase the access to employer um, groups as well, and various sizes um, of employers that, are, that belong to the, to the chambers and local business groups. <clears throat> um, one caution that they issued was that the health department should be clear about what they can bring to the table so as not to raise any um, expectations that can't be met. So uh, emphasizing what Lori indicated about um, targeting small to medium-sized businesses, our key informants um, echoed that and noted that these businesses may be aware and may be willing to promote healthy work sites, but just don't know where to start and don't have the, the resources to engage private consultants to help them with that. Um, and the RFP informants also noted that it's easier to implement change in smaller businesses because there's less bureaucracy. And some of these sectors they noted as easiest to engage included white collar, uh, businesses, professional workers, service-oriented industries such as many in Maricopa County, um, administrative organizations, and employees who have nine to five or flexible schedules, and businesses with low employee turnover. <clears throat> the low-hanging fruit that they identified included nonprofit organizations, healthcare organizations who may have a similar um, mission, insurers, schools, and universities. Uh, many of these were noted to be likely to engage and take on wellness initiatives. More challenging businesses to engage include those with shift workers, multiple sites, lower wages, uh, those requiring significant travel, um, and those with round-the-clock 24-7 coverage, as well as manufacturing and industry um, sectors. So um, they also recommended leveraging existing business relationships by targeting agencies that are already working with the health department in some capacity. Because there, in, in those relationships, trust has already been established, and that might be a really good place to start. <clears throat> Engaging community champions as role models was a really effective strategy that was recommended 
to identify some local businesses that are, have already successfully begun to adopt worksite wellness initiatives and have them speak to their peers and tell their story and try to promote this strategy. Um, Partnership for Prevention's Leading by Example program has been promoting this strategy since 2007. And in some cases, it was noted that the county or state health department itself can serve as a role model. So in outlining potential roles for local health departments, key informants suggestions included developing or disseminating toolkits, convening businesses, providing training in TA, and train the trainer approaches. And we're going to be talking about each of these individually in the coming slides. So in terms of uh, developing or disseminating toolkits, um, it suggested that the local health department can work, uh, try to be seen as the go-to place for how to approach healthy worksite policies and initiatives. They can provide sample employer surveys, um, guidelines for developing a healthy worksite committee, as well as sample policies for businesses to consider, particularly those that are high impact and low cost. Um, they can create hard copies as well as a, a web presence that can be, you know, freely accessible to any of these small businesses that, that need these resources. Um, they you just need to be noted that they need to be geographically and culture, culturally applicable to, to the area in Maricopa County. <clears throat> the CDC is developing a healthy worksite guide that should be available in the near future, and several other states have, have toolkits that can be adapted to, to your community. So, in terms of convening and promoting businesses, um, as I mentioned, the Partnership for Prevention's Lead by, Leading by Example initiative um, does, does this. They are a peer-to-peer -peer communication campaign that educates CEOs about the benefits of worksite health promotion and encourages employers to adopt effective practices to improve employee health. Uh, trained CEOs successfully implement wellness policies. Um, are encouraged to share their knowledge and experience with fellow business leaders and encourage them to follow suit. <clears throat> and by collecting, by providing collective learning and networking opportunities, um, the health department can, can facilitate uh, businesses' um, opportunities to learn from one another. And many of these trainings target HR personnel and can be publicized widely with press releases and offer such uh, courses and topics as worksite uh, wellness workshop worksite wellness 101 and may occur in such settings as a lunch and learn or breakfast before the workday and have, have tend to be really well received by the business community. Employee recognition programs are also um, a, uh, an approach that has been uh, very successful and these involve selecting particular champions and and businesses that are doing a really good job with worksite wellness and giving them a public award, not necessarily a financial award, just a recognition award. Um, for example, Sonoma County's Healthy Workplace Award um, and the Healthiest Employers of Nashville Award. And then the businesses you know, can have that pride and display the awards in their press and in their, in their work sites. Um, by providing training and technical assistance, local health departments can facilitate planning and prioritization processes with employers uh, and you know, show them how to implement the toolkits that are available and help connect them to existing community resources. Um, about half of the county health departments interviewed provide direct technical assistance to help employers conduct environmental assessments and facilitate the uh, implementation of worksite policies. Um, the Healthy Worksite coordinators predominantly adhere to WellCOA's seven benchmarks and the seven Cs, uh, capturing senior level support, creating cohesive wellness teams, collecting data to, um, to drive health efforts, crafting an operating plan, choosing appropriate interventions, creating a supportive environment, and consistently evaluating outcomes. Uh, now, the train trainer approach uh, was, was a very interesting one in which um, health departments have the opportunity to really amplify the number of businesses that they can reach. Um, by partnering with um, another organization that does outreach and education and, may, and has multiple sites across the county or the state, such as the YMCA, the health department staff can train um, the, the staff of this partner organization in healthy worksite initiatives. Um, 
and in best practices and toolkits and so forth. And then the partner staff will then directly work with businesses one-on-one -on -one and provide that more intensive uh, technical assistance and support. So this approach requires fewer resources but has a much higher impact and a, a broader, broader reach. Uh, the state of Wisconsin has done this extremely successfully and have trained many other states and are, are actually very willing to come out and talk with your staff as well. Um, some potential opportunities uh, beyond those roles that we just discussed include um, helping businesses to analyze their insurance offerings. Few health departments do this right now, but many express interest in doing so in the future. Uh, the, the county healthy worksite coordinators that we spoke with um, see this as a growing need, especially once the Affordable Health Care Act is implemented. Uh, we, did, we talked to some uh, informants as well about collective purchasing of healthy worksite programs. None of the health, local health departments we interviewed were involved in this right now, but when asked, they did express interest in exploring this area further. Um, developing alliances with benefits brokers to try to uh, identify and promote wellness services was another potential opportunity for the future, as well as integrating healthy worksite initiatives with occupational health and safety efforts, as Lori mentioned. <clears throat> Organizationally, all, all the people we spoke to emphasized the importance of having a dedicated go-to staff person at the county health department to effectively build and sustain relationships with local businesses. This doesn't necessarily need to be a full-time position, in fact, Staff could even be cross-purpose, such as those already interfacing with external organizations, could be integrated, could integrate healthy worksite issues into their work. Responsibilities of the, the designated coordinator of healthy worksite program would include outreach, organizing, trainings, providing technical assistance, um, developing convenings, and serving as a liaison between the health department and the business associations and organizations. Um, and these programs and coordinators have been housed in a variety of departments and divisions among health departments. It really ba was based on where the idea initially generated within the department. Um, and, and they function equally well regardless of where they're housed. The budgets were actually quite small. Um, they usually started with some seed funding and did not really extend beyond covering the staff time. Um, they ranged from about $40,000 to $75,000 per year and covered the staff of the, the salary of the staff as well as you know a, a few extra expenses traveling printing uh, the cost of the breakfasts and lunches and convening um, and, and a few even covered basic you know very basic minimal supplies such as pedometers or water bottles things like that um, facilitators, things that, ha uh, that really facilitate the adoption of worksite wellness programs include buy-in from the top. Um, national experts and health department staff agreed that um, buy-in at the highest organizational levels is essential to creating a culture of health and wellness in a workplace, as is the formation of a wellness committee so that the responsibility for this cultural movement is shared and not, doesn't lie with one individual. Uh, recognizing individual champions within the work site and for multi-site employers um, that to recognize a champion at each site was seen as really important. <clears throat> Organization-wide participation is critical. Incentive programs can really be helpful motivators, as I mentioned previously, and having some on-site resources um, is also a facilitator of participation. The challenges that they mentioned include the difference in cultures and language between public health as the public health sector and the business culture. Um, it, it was noted that they lack a common language for communication and suggested that the collaborations between the two sectors begin on narrowly defined projects um, to build a history of success. Um, sometimes employer buy-in and recruitment can be a challenge. Of course, budgets and time are, are, are always a challenge across the board and sustainability needs to be kept in mind. It was noted that keeping stakeholders engaged and interested in the work of, of a coalition or collective learning was described as an ongoing challenge and that, that needs to be uh, kept fresh. Bureaucratic obstacles were also noted on both sides and the possibility of evaluation is, is an ongoing challenge that should be built in upfront with any new initiative. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Jody Silverman who's gonna talk to you about the school sector. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Tony. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first thing that I'm going to say about the school sector um, is that it is a highly important and promising sector 
there are huge cost savings vis-a-vis uh, -vis a favorable return on investment, and it's very lar it's, it's largely untapped and, a, and to be considered a low-hanging fruit. And I'll go into each of those in greater detail um, as we continue to talk. One uh, piece of information that I wanted to mention by way of background, Tony indicated that we spoke with a total of 49 key informants. Um, in, in producing this report and, and learning what we learned and making recommendations. Twenty-five of those were from uh, the school sector, if you will, primarily um, from, the local, from local school districts throughout the country, including two in Arizona, the Mesa Unified School District and the Chandler Unified School District, and I'll talk a little bit more about them later on. Um, we also talked with some national folks around um, healthy work sites in schools in particular, that would include the CDC, the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, and the um, Directors of Health Promotion and Education, all of which are largely involved in uh, not just work site wellness, but specifically in the school sector. And then um, sort of tangential topics, if you will, but very related to work site wellness in schools, we talked to, I talked to two national folks regarding occupational safety and health, one at NIOSH, and an individual with the um, National Education Association Health Information Network. And lastly, uh, the wellness mandate in the Childhood Reauthorization, Nutrition Reauthorization Act, was something we were curious about as to whether or not that was an impetus for greater staff wellness programs and, and uh, faculty wellness programs in schools. So for more information on that, I spoke with uh, the National Association of State Boards of Education. So moving along, uh, one of the important pieces that we mentioned is that the schools are highly important promising is a highly important and promising sector. The main reason is that in addition to teaching students, they are employers. They employ a very large part of the proportion of the community, and in fact, in many communities are the largest employers. There's teachers, there are administrators, school lunch personnel, et cetera. Um, so they are employers, and much in the way of Worksite wellness in general, you can get at a large part of a work population by working in schools. Uh, the other piece is that they're in schools for long periods of day, particularly teachers, faculty. They're in school seven to nine hours a day between classes, pre-class preparation, after-class preparation, and seeing students. Um, another piece is that teachers' behaviors and attitudes, they're very much role models for students. And that's important. If we're trying to get at student wellness, we should also think about teachers and faculty and staff and how that can influence um, uh, the, the, the student's wellness um, as well as, in general, um, a healthy staff makes for a much happier, much more productive staff. And lastly, not to be overlooked, is that uh, staff members and faculty members are part of families and part of a larger community. So there's a community ripple effect, if you will, in uh, worksite wellness based in schools. I noted the huge cost savings, and this is a theme that's run through our presentation today. Um, even though most wellness coordinators that are based in schools raise the issue of not having enough resources vis-a-vis -vis time or money, they also said, don't let that get in the way. That if you have someone who's passionate, you've got to move forward. So in other words, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money to make this happen. Um, there's a decrease in health care costs, uh, particularly for schools that are self-insured because they um, can, uh, you know, save money on their health plans. Lori mentioned absenteeism and presenteeism. Um, for, for schools, the absenteeism is also connected to uh, substitute teacher costs. So those are huge proportions of school district budgets, paying for substitute teachers. The fewer substitute teachers you need to have, the more savings there is in the school budget. Um, and when I talked with folks, the number one driver of this issue, even for superintendents and principals that are very concerned about health, the number one driver was budgets. And we will talk a little bit more about that. Um, one of the things that we need to talk about is why schools pose particularly unique challenges. Um, first and foremost, they are very different, uh, they, they pose a very different culture for most work sites. They focus on academic success in children. They are not primarily focused on the health and well-being of students or faculty and staff. They understand the connection between a healthy staff and healthy teachers and better education, better, you know, a, a happier and better trained staff, but it's still not their primary focus. They're focused on test scores, 
They're t focused on graduation rates, and this all often connects to the budget, what, what schools are getting funded, what schools are not getting funded. Um, the other piece to the different culture is that schools have a very different language. Because they're focused on, focused on academics and test scores, that's their language. Um, the language of health is not something they're familiar with. And also some languages, some words and, and um, uh, you know, concepts are very different things in these communities. The word surveillance to those of us in the public health community is a good thing. In the education community where local control is very important, surveillance brings up big brother looking after you, trying to tell you what kinds of decisions to make for your kids and your, and your faculty. So again, understanding the culture when you move into schools is very important. Uh, and lastly, even though there is non-classroom time, there are lunch breaks, there's faculty meetings, what, or, or rather pre-school time and post-school time, it's still taken up with academics, if you will. There are faculty meetings, there are student meetings, there are lesson plans that have to be made, uh, have to be done. So um, the, um, the idea that we'll now move into is that the schedules are very inflexible. The idea of flex time is not something you can introduce in a school. Teachers have to be in their classrooms, they have to be teaching. Bus drivers have to be driving the bus at appropriate times. Um, and there's really not very much time between classes. Um, I mentioned that before and after school is for administrative meetings and student conferences and lesson planning. And lastly, the enormous amount of stress and pressure that teachers are under, particularly teachers but other staff as well, to perform, to meet those graduation requirements, to meet those academic success requirements. Um, Lori mentioned earlier of, uh, how important uh, the, or how significant the role of stress is in a workplace. It came up as the number one health issue, if you will, among faculty at um, schools, and yet, as, as I'll talk about in a little bit, it wasn't a strong part of any worksite wellness in school. Other unique challenges in a school sector um, is that you have different populations there. Faculty and staff are very different. I noted how faculty um, work full days. Staff, however, work partial days, and those partial days are very different. So food service personnel will be there for a particular part of the day. Bus drivers are there in the morning and in the afternoon. Maintenance workers or facilities workers are there during the day. So finding a time, if you will, to run a program or to enforce a policy that will meet everybody's needs is going to be very, very difficult. Um, in addition to their schedules being very different, communication methods is very different. Uh, the majority of people learn about worksite wellness meetings and programs via email and websites. That was made very clear. However, a lot of staff don't have access to email or are not on the web, and so they are reliant upon paper flyers and their supervisors getting the word to them. Um, and then lastly, it's a, a very different demographic population and very different, very different demographic profile. Um, teachers are well educated. A lot of staff are not necessarily well educated, don't necessarily need to be um, to do their jobs, and so there may be communication barriers there. There are also some socioeconomic impacts regarding what health needs they might have. And clearly, the greatest participation is among faculty um, as opposed to staff, though I did talk to some very innovative school districts that were doing some great things for bus drivers in particular, school food service personnel, focusing on those, tar uh, pop targeting those populations and bringing the work to them, if you will. Um, thinking about what the facilitators are, are in schools, they're not much different from what the facilitators are in other work sites. By and large, a buy-in from the top is the most important thing. If you have a superintendent or a principal who makes this a policy, who says we are going to have a culture of health in this school, we're going to make time for it, we're going to weave it into everything we do, then it happens. Um, if you can demonstrate the cost savings, whether it's to the principal, to the superintendent, particularly to the school board. Um, improved teaching and outcomes can be tied to a healthy workforce. If you can show that, the, la you know, the lower of lowering of presenteeism and the lowering of absenteeism, if you can show that, that's a facilitator. Um, having a champion at each school is important. Um, Pretty much everyone I talked to said that um, the success of their their efforts in schools were really dependent on the leadership and then somebody on the ground who was willing to carry this forward. 
And then lastly, something interesting is that self-insured districts can really negotiate wellness benefits with payers. This is something that the Mesa Unified School District is doing. So in addition to the various wellness components that health insurers often offer, in Mesa, for instance, they can negotiate um, for lower rates. There's another school district I talked to where every time they renew their health insurance, they make sure there's money in there to pay, pay a small stipend to a wellness coordinator at every school. So there's some bargaining power there, if you will. Moving on to what the roles for lo um, local health departments can be in schools, again, very similar to what, <clears throat> pardon me, what you will find in other sectors. And it depends on how uh, hands-on or directly involved the Maricopa wants to be or is able to be. So you can provide training, um, technical assistance and training. You can um, develop or adapt toolkits. And I think the important uh, point here is adapt adapt adaptation of a toolkit. There are a lot of toolkits out here. Tony referenced them. Um, we've referenced many of them in the resource section of our report. Do not reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of really good stuff out there that you can um, adapt. Broker relationships with community organizations. Again, it, it, whether it's the um, chambers, whether it's local Ys, local gyms, gymnastics clubs, um, and, and in some instances, just a local business who might be willing to pay for advertising or might be able to pay for the cost of a, a water bottle or a pedometer. Again, demonstrating the cost savings, um, and evaluating impact. Very much uh, uh, to what Tony learned, evaluating the impact in schools is, is not done. They don't really evaluate the impact, and to the extent they do, it's process. You know, how many programs did they run, how many walks did they run, and how many people participated. Um, one important piece of research that I wanted to reference is a, a research project funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation called Bridging the Gap. And it focuses on how, po how policy and environmental strategies impact um, diet, physical activity, and tobacco use among youth. However, there's also, as part of this research, the largest ongoing nationwide evaluation of school district wellness policies. And some preliminary findings around this um, show that really huge majorities of school districts do not have policies in place. So staff wellness programs, over 70% of districts nationwide don't have any policy in place. 5%, nearly 6% have a strong required policy. Um, in, in terms of staff as role modeling healthy behaviors, um, over 70%, again, of school districts nationwide do not have a policy in place. Nearly 20% um, have a strong required policy. That's a pretty good number. And lastly, in terms of physical op opportunities for school staff, 80% do not have a policy in place. So there's a lot of room here for growth and improvement. Um, so thinking about what local health departments and schools can do to really take the lead, where, where can Maricopa maybe be a little bit more innovative, innovative and take the lead? First of all is to advance policy, write some of those policy, sample policies and distribute them. Um, leverage the coordinated school health program, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And as Lori noted, integrate healthy work sites with occupational health and safety programs. So regarding policy advancement, um, you can use the wellness mandate and the Childhood Nutrition Reauthorization Act as a model for staff and faculty wellness. That act um, mandates that every school have a wellness policy for students. Some schools are abiding by it, some schools are not, but it could be a way to profile and highlight the importance of wellness policies and transition into school uh, staff wellness. Um, work with wellness coordinators to include wellness policies and insurance benefit packages, as I mentioned. And lastly, you need to cultivate uh, the superintendent to, uh, in order to advance policy. Um, the coordinated school health program, the reason I'm mentioning that is that of the eight domains that are part of coordinated school health, most of them focus on student wellness. However, one of them focuses on health promotion for staff. And in Arizona, in addition to the funding that comes from CDC, it's a CDC-funded program that goes to 22 states and one tribal government, the state of Arizona also puts money behind their coordinated school health program. So there could be a real opportunity here for interdepartmental um, work and promotion of wellness 
through your coordinated school health program. Um, I would say that um, you can also share the tools and the resources and the best practices between the students and the staff wellness program. In Arizona, the focus of the coordinated school health program is physical activity, nutrition, and tobacco use and prevention. Um, lastly, I'm just going to go over this piece very quickly. Um, in, in our interviews after the literature review, nobody was really marrying um, occupational safety and healthy or environmental health with their policies around worksite wellness. That being said, we wanted to highlight the importance of this because asthma, for instance, um, are the highest among a respiratory ailments or the highest among school staff and asthma among teachers is nearly double that of other occupations. So clearly there is a need um, and an opportunity here for focusing on um, uh, health and wellness as, as far as the air quality and the building facilities go. There's something that the US EPA has put together called Tools for Schools. It's an evidence-based program. And it is not currently happening in um, conjunction with healthy work sites, but it could be an opportunity for Maricopa to marry these two issues. Um, it's a role model. It works best at the school district level. Again, how involved you want to be is up to you. You can have a web presence. You can create the tools. You can go into the school and do your own assessments. Um, I rushed through that last part so that we have time for quick recommendations and some questions. So firstly, as we move into recommendations, the first thing that we recommend that Maricopa do is to define and clarify your role. Where do you want to be involved? Where do you think you can make the greatest impact? Finalizing that action plan. We talked about that quite a bit in our retreat. Without a plan, it'll be difficult to get there, and you might overlook the need for evaluation, which is important. Identify your internal partners people that will cheerlead, who can leverage, you can leverage their expertise and, and also to ensure there's no duplication of services. And lastly, um, integrating that healthy worksite initiative into occupational health and safety. <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over to Tony now for some additional recommendations. Hi. Yeah, additionally, we recommend that the Maricopa um, County Department of Health consider marketing and branding their services in worksite wellness and the expertise that they can offer, perhaps by creating a healthy worksite website, healthy worksite website or newsletter. Um, identify specific staff to manage the program. And as we mentioned, starting to collect and adapt tools that they might be able to distribute and to really make, try to make sure to build in evaluation efforts up front. In terms of the business sector, um, we recommend starting with the low-hanging fruit that we've identified, um, including the school sectors as well as the health institutions and universities and small employers in the area. Seeking out, um, um, sorry, seeking out the small employers and in, in addition demonstrating the value that they can add, um, perhaps by working with uh, vendors, uh, benefits vendors and worksite vendors to uh, highlight how, how, the, how these services can really bring and add a benefit to employers. And so the school sector, Jody's going to pick it up. Um, firstly, reaching out to local school, school districts would be your very first priority. And if you, you know, there are many models throughout the country, but right in your own state, Mason, Chandler, and we have plenty of contact information there. Um, facilitating joint use agreements with the community, getting Ys and gyms to open up their facilities. Um, or to come to the schools and provide classes by way of example around um, active living. And lastly, again, to leverage that coordinated school health program, primarily because in Arizona you have a much more robust program uh, by way of state funding supplementing the national funding um, for that program. So that concludes our presentation. We're sorry we went over. We had a lot of information we wanted to convey to you.